Can I get away with saying either one? Yes, just Paul. Okay. That's fine. Just Paul? Yeah, that's Okay, fine. Paul. That makes it easy for me. Just like the Apostle. Just like the Apostle. <laughs> Terrific. What's your favourite sport? That's an easy one. Soccer. Soccer. <laughs> Did you play? Not really. Well, every Danish boy plays soccer uh, at some point in time. However, I stopped because I got too old. But um, watching in TV is still a sport, you know? <laughs> still good. Is it the national sport in? Yes. It is. Yeah. Okay. What's the national sport in New Zealand, by the way? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> no answer? Um, Paul, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about how you met your wife? Is your wife with you at camp? Yes, but she, she's somewhere, somewhere, she's somewhere else, else? This, this, this morning. She has heard me many times, so she doesn't need to be here. Okay. So I can tell whatever, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I met her at the sanitarium at Scottsboro, which we still owned at that time. Um, I taught the Bible, philosophy, ethics, and the various other topics at the physical therapy school, and she uh, came down to work at first as a secretary for one of the, the medical doctors. Um, I knew her name because she was a subscriber of a theological magazine I produced in, in those years. But I met her first time because I was going out to preach somewhere. I was not employed by the church, but that has never stopped me. Um, so I went out to preach somewhere and I have agreed with a group of young people from Scottsboro that they should join me and, and uh, uh, so we had a little singing and a little extra for the worship service and for some reason they had brought her along, she had just arrived and I was sitting at her side on the, the whole trip and most of the day and um, after that my decision was made up. Yeah. Terrific, terrific. While we're talking about your wife, which probably we shouldn't do while she's not here, should we, really, but anyway. What has your wife taught you or shown you about God? I'll have to look at the watch. <laughs> when are we going to finish? <laughs> now, when you have been married for more than 25 years, you, you learn a lot. And I think that we learn a lot in general about God from other human beings, not least from those who are closest to us. Um, well, I think she has, uh, let me just take a few things. Uh, she has probably taught me somewhat about how to have, to, to keep uh, the feet on the ground. She hasn't ever managed to teach me to be practical, but at least she has managed me maybe to to, to drag me a little down from the theological heights. Um, then, of course, she has taught me a lot of, of uh, giving you the sense of family and, and uh, to, to live with God is to live in a family. So your family, the sense of family is important to know God. I, I would say this is probably the most important. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you very, very much. This morning uh, for our prayer time, I thought we'd try something a little different. Um, and I'd like to ask my good friend, Pastor Garth Bainbridge, to come up at the front. Um, Garth and I used to play golf in Townsville together. We, we passed it together in the Northern Australian Conference. So he's a good friend of mine. And um, Garth... You are from which country? Originally from South Africa. So, South Africa. So, yep. you know, we won't worry about what happened the other night, will we, New Zealanders, at the cricket? Okay, we won't worry. I'm shouting for New Zealand for tonight's game. Oh, you are, are you? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, <laughs> will it help? <laughs> will, will it help? <laughs> I'll open the window. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Garth, what is your, your native tongue? My native tongue is English. Um, South Africa... The white population in South Africa, basically the two large language groups are English and Afrikaans. Okay. And I grew up on the English side of the line. Okay. But you know how to speak Afrikaans? Oh, yes. Um, most communicators in South Africa would have to be able to speak both languages, teaching, preaching, whatever. 
that we are talking on English and Afrikaans, and it helps to be able to talk in, in a, a black African language as well. Okay, okay. Which I'm able to do, fortunately, which helps Good, me. good <laughs> one. This morning, um, Paul is, of course, uh, from Denmark. Denmark, where the language is Danish, isn't it? And so I thought what it would be nice this morning to do is to ask these two gentlemen to pray in their native tongue. Okay? Um, and then I'll close with an English prayer. And so hopefully this, um, although you might not be able to understand uh, what is being said, we still know that we pray to the same God, don't we? And he hears us no matter what language we use. And so I trust this will be a very meaningful experience for some of you, or for all of you, this morning. So, um, Paul, would you like to lead us in prayer? Oh, stor Gud, no. Jeg er i din verden skuer, som du har skabt med al magts bud. Der bryder sjælen ud i lovsangslyd, og store Gud, og store Gud. Vær sammen med os denne formiddag i vores bibelstudie, vi beder Jesu navn. Amen. Vores himmelse Fader, det er for vores forrecht om I, hvad Gud er fra de hele af, Fader, det kan noem. Vetende, at det betekent, at vores elke en der I uh, gekendes, dat jy ons lief het, soos een vader sy kinders lief het. Ons bid dat jy nou ons sal sien, soos ons om jy woord vergader. Mag dit wees, dat die selfde heilige gees, wat die boodskap in die eerste plek aan Daniel gegee het, vir ons dit nou sal duidelik maak aan ons. Our Father in Heaven, we thank you that you are a God that understands each one of us, so personally, so individually, so uniquely. And we thank you, Lord, for diversity. We thank you that you have created so many wonderful, wonderful things in this world. And we thank you, Lord, for the nations that make up this world. We thank you that although we might not be able to understand what somebody else is saying, we know that you do. And we thank you, Lord, that you don't look on the outside but you look on the inside. And Lord, we ask a special blessing on Pastor Paul this morning as he leads our study. We thank you, Lord, for him. We thank you for the role that you have given him in your church. And we ask that a, a very special blessing will rest on he and his family today. And so bless us now as we study your word together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As probably not many of you realized, I, I fell for the temptation in my prayer to quote one of the songs we just sung, How Great Thou Art. Because actually, though it is not stated in the hymnal, the song is Swedish. It's a Swedish folk melody. And as Sweden is a neighboring country to Denmark, it is very well known in Denmark as well, of course. Um, it is a Swedish folk melody and the text the Christian text was produced by uh, a Swede who actually was a member of the Swedish parliament. Now, how come it has ended up uh, with an American author and composer? Because he heard it somewhere in Russia, it's true, and he went back to the States and he bought the copyright. But it is not his production. O store gul, nai ai din verden skua, sam du har skab di kraft al max gul. And I will spare you for the rest. <laughs> but if you get Manuel to sing it, you really, if he hasn't sung it already, I know he has it in one of his, his CDs and that's a, a wonderful edition. Worship conquers death. Now we have looked at the, the basic for worship in the book of Daniel. Now today and tomorrow we will move a little further and we will move into some of the texts that are regarded as maybe a little more difficult. As you will notice, I'll not so much go into the details and stop there as look at the, the scope. Worship conquers death. We have two stories in the book of Daniel, in Daniel 3 and Daniel 6, 
that are very similar. In Daniel 3 and Daniel 6, the issue is prayer and worship. In Daniel 3, the friends of Daniel are thrown into a fire furnace. They are actually sentenced to death because they refuse to pray to an idol. In Daniel 6, the well-known story, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den because he is praying. So prayer and death, worship and death, is linked together. Prayer and worship is a matter of life and death. Now, in our country, your country, worship is not a matter of life and death. But I tell you, in your personal life, prayer is a matter of life or death. There is a difference between the two chapters. In chapter 3, it is a matter of a public prayer. In chapter 6, it's a matter of Daniel regularly praying. He simply goes on doing what he has always been doing. In chapter 3, it is a matter of refusing to commit a sin. And by doing that, lose your life. In chapter 6, it is a matter of continuing to do what is your duty and your pleasure in your relationship to God. And that may cost you your life. In chapter 3, everyone would be able to see, would the Jews worship or not? And that is a challenge. But it's certainly also a challenge for Daniel. Because, of course, these, these enemies, the satraps and ministers, they were gathering to see. But actually what he did was quite private. Nobody as far as he was concerned, would need to know whether he stopped praying. That's a completely different challenge. Now, you could say, well, it's only a matter of 30 days without communing with God. Nobody will be able to see it. So why not refrain from it? So that's a difference, though there is the similarity. If we look at the characters in, in the two stories, there are also, of course, similarities. The friends and Daniel can be compared. The Chaldeans, who were eating pieces of the three friends, can be compared to the ministers or the satraps, or how we translate it, that were envious of Daniel and tried to get rid of him. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, can be compared to the king of Medo Persia, Darius, or Darius. On the la last one, actually, it shows that, uh, that there is a huge difference between the two. But I have chosen for these studies only to focus on Daniel and his friends. If we had had time to do study on, on the kings, we would have learned a lot of how to relate to the non Christians the rulers and other people, secular people in the world. Now, let's look a little more on the story in Daniel chapter 6. What is going on? I'm, I'm sure I don't need to repeat it to you. This is a children's story, and even though you are not children anymore, I guess that you all have been. That's one of the things that's difficult to avoid. And if you feel that, that the young people, they are uh, too noisy, too arrogant, too quick, too intelligent, that's how I feel when I am with my, my boys, I, I feel stupid for all that they know. Now, I'll tell you a secret. Whenever you meet young people, you're able to say to them, I know more than you. Now, I know more about what it means to be young than you know about what it means to be old. <laughs> you have an advantage. Now, you have all been children. We know the, the, the story about Daniel in the lion's den. And we know that in the new reign of the Medo Persian Empire, Daniel was chosen to be one of the, 
the, the high-ranking um, officers, you could say, by Darius and his enemies, other ministers, were envious and they tried to find some reason to get rid of him. They couldn't find in his administration or in his moral life, so they went to religion. These people were not religious. They were not attacking Daniel because he had another religion. So in one sense, it was not a matter of, of religion. No, no religion sentiments. They simply were jealous. And then they used religion. That is often the case. Religious wars may be labeled religious wars, but just as often they are simply a matter of the wish for power. Now, they went to the king, who certainly does not come out at the beginning as a very wise man. Now, he actually had tried to, to change the administration. You know why? Because he didn't want to be bothered too much. And that's, of course, an ambition for every administrator, because what do you think your, your president likes the most? That people are calling him and complaining, or that people are leaving him alone? And it is always nice to, to be able to put some people in between as a buffer zone. Now, whenever you have a complaint, go to this person. So, so that, that was something of what he was doing. And he was not too wise. So they went to him and they fooled him into this stupid decree, this stupid law that could not be changed, that for a certain short period of time, where there was religious confusion, probably after the takeover of, of the new empire, that all, pub, all prayers should be directed to Darius as a symbol of the Medo Persian Empire. It was foolish and he realized it, but only later. And then they caught Daniel praying. Let me read to you a, a few of the verses from the chapter so that we are uh, digging into the biblical text in New International Version. Verse 10 from chapter 6. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. Then there's a little strange translation here, just as he has done before, uh, but that is to indicate that was his usual habit. These men then went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about the royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who pays, prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. And then they tell him about Daniel. Now, there is a phrase here that is not really uh, telling what is in the text. When it says, these men went as a group and found Daniel, so they went to the king. The best is probably to say they hurried, they hastened. They were frantic. And, and all through this part of the story, actually, you would find if not in translation, then in Hebrew you, or in Aramaic, you would find uh, expressions that indicate the frantic mood of these people. They were eager to get things going. While whenever Daniel is mentioned, there is the sense of calmness. What does he do? He heard the, the decree. He calmly goes back to his home and do what he has always done. Prayer should provide that kind of calmness in a frantic world. Sometimes we are so unrestful, so, so eager to have things done, so stressed, that it is hard for us to be alone. Sometimes we are bothered with our sins, so it is hard for us to be alone. We dare be alone, dare not be alone. God wants us 
to stop, to pause, to be calm. If we are bothered by sin, to confess it. Receive peace within. Prayer is a time of, of calmness, of rest. The story, as it is told, emphasizes Daniel's personal relationship with God. This is the first one. And this is a, you, you're able to find that out actually by yourself if you, if you look for it. God is mentioned in chapter 6 12 times. Now, you may say, well, God is there all the time. Yes, but 12 times God is, or God is explicitly mentioned. Twice it's a reference to any God. You are not to pray to any other God. The other times, eight of the times, it is directly linked to Daniel. You are God, Daniel, the God of Daniel. And the two remaining expressions are the living God, which is found in close com co connection with the God of Daniel. Let's try to find some of these uh, verses. Let's read from verse 16. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May you, a God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. You, a God. What did they say in the beginning? In verse, uh, I think it's verse 5. We will never find any basis for charges against the man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Now you could say, well, and so what? Well, it is important and significant because if you go through the book of Daniel in other places, God is not always mentioned directly. In chapter 1, you have only three specific, explicit references to God. In chapter 2, every reference is found on the lips of some of the persons involved, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. So if you go through and count the number that, of times that God is mentioned, you will find that chapter 6 is unique. And it is unique that it is your God, his God, the God of Daniel. It indicates his personal relationship just as you do the prayer, the praying. The next point I want to make from this chapter and the story, and I see that... We got started a little late, so you will be hungry in the end. <laughs> Let me move on. You find in this chapter two kingdoms in conflict. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of the media persons or the, the human empires. Two kingdoms, two empires in conflict. Darius reaches a conclusion in the end that God is a living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. But the two kingdoms struggle when it comes to their laws. The Medes and the Persians had laws that could not be demolished. But God also has laws that cannot be demolished. And sometimes the laws and of, of human empires and the laws of the empire of God clash. And this is what is happening here. And the final element I want to point out in chapter 6 is that it is also a matter of judgment. Daniel is condemned according to human law. He is condemned to death. But when Darius finds him uh, after the night of trial, Daniel replies to his shout whether he is alive. He replies with the words in, I think it is verse 21 and 2. O king, live forever. And this is the first time, the only time, by the way, that Daniel and his friends address any king with this phrase of politeness. Because in this instance, Darius has actually understood that he's not to live forever. And then you're able to be polite. Daniel continues. I, I, I have struggled with the wind up here. 
My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. So these are three themes of the story. The personal relationship with Daniel and God. Two kingdoms, two empires in conflict, and the laws in conflict. And then the theme of judgment. Daniel is found innocent. Let's move from chapter 6, the children's story, to chapter 7. And you may say, what is the relationship between chapter 6 and chapter 7? I hope you will see there is one. What is the relationship with the children's stories and these apocalyptic visions, these strange symbols? Visions for adult people. Now you'll find, I hope, that the, the narratives in the book of Daniel illustrate the prophecies. What do we find in the book of Daniel in chapter 7? What happens? First of all, you have earthly kingdoms, the beast of prey that, that rise up of the sea. The word that is used about lifting Daniel up from the lion's den is actually the same in the close of the previous chapter, is the same that is used about the, the beast coming up of the sea in chapter 7. Next, after this view of history, you have a heavenly court scene. In that heavenly court scene, the beasts are judged, and the authority is given to a man. Now, the phrase son of man simply means a man. This is Semitic usage. If you want to accuse someone of being a fox, you would say in any Semitic language, oh, you're a son of a fox. Now, a son of man means he is simply a man. And, and compare for one moment these beasts of prey with a man. And the last beast of prey ha has teeth of iron. Who will win? Well, I would prefer not to meet any lion, bear, or panther. Or any animal with teeth of iron. And so it is here. That, that Jesus is presented here just as a man indicates, among other things, that he is the seemingly weak part. In the book of Revelation, you have Jesus, the Son of Man, presented as a lamb that is slain. And when that lamb faces the monsters of Revelation, you will know, if you saw the movie, if it is produced as a movie, you would know that the lamb has no chance, it seems. So here, Jesus is the non-violent, the man who is not using force, and he is given the authority. You know why? Because he is the only one who has never used his power for himself. Therefore, he is the only one who is worthy as king forever. And when that happens, after that, those who are his, the saints of the Most High, the saints of Christ, will be given authority and kingdom with him. And then we have the realization, Jesus is coming down to earth, the everlasting kingdom is established, and there will be worship forever and ever. Let's look at that worship in chapter 7. We're not so much concerned about the historical prophecies, but with the worship. There is a worship going on now, and there is a worship to come. This is a worship going on now, as you find it on the screen from Daniel 7.10. A river of fire streamed forth before him, that is the Ancient of Days. Thousands upon thousands served him, myriads upon myriads attended him. The court sat, and the books were opened. The general setting is the setting of worship. Heavenly beings are worshipping God. There is also a worship for eternity mentioned in the chapter. Let me read to you from chapter 7, verse, verses 13 and 14. Then I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He had come to the Ancient of Days and had been led into his presence. Authority, glory, and kingdom had been given to him. All people, nations, and tongues will worship him. 
His authority is everlasting and will not be taken away, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. And in the end of the chapter, in verse 27, it said that rulers of the earth will worship him. That is, he has been given power. When his kingdom is established, everyone will worship him forever and ever. Now, I have told you that the narratives and the visions go together. I think I will be very brief on this one because of time. I just want you to, to realize that there is some patterns within the stories that are repeated in the visions. Do you know that the first that happens to Daniel and his friends is that they go through an investigation. They have a trial period of 10 days and then there is an investigation. Are they fit? Next, they have an investigation, an examination after three years of study and they pass the examination. Actually, the reason they are put in that position is that the people had sinned. The people was apostate. For that reason, God gave them into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel and his friends, who were personally not the reason for, for, for the sins of the people, they were brought into tribulation and wrath. They were examinated, investigated. And then God delivered and gave them the victory. That is a pattern you find again also in the prophecies. Let's move on to, to chapter 6 and 7 in particular. And let me point out to you some of the similarities. Now, you know the story in chapter 6. You know the basic outline of chapter 7. In chapter 6, you have kingdoms in conflict. That is what you have in chapter 7 as well. Not only one kingdom, but four. But basically, it is the same. A clash with the empire of God. The alliance in both places, by the way. And next, there's a question of worship. May the God whom you continually serve is what Darius says to Daniel, rescue you. And then we are moved to heaven and we look at the continued service, worship of God there. Let's read chapter 6, three times a day. Daniel got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God. And as we read, I quoted, May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. And you will find that that word, serve, the Aramaic word, word, is just the word that is used in verse 14. All peoples, nations, and tongues will worship him or serve him. So there is a link in worship. We have another link between the two chapters. We have the kingdoms that are in conflict. We have the issue of worship. Then we have laws in conflict. That is part of having kingdoms in conflict. A kingdom is defined by a certain set of laws. In the case of the Medio Persian Empire, we have specific laws uh, that could not be changed. In chapter 7, you have a little horn mentioned in prophecy, and that little horn, it is said, will attempt to change times and law. You know that phrase, don't you? If you have ever been to an evangelistic campaign and there still were people at the end, you will note it. You've heard this before. Now, I want to go a little further and point out something that, that uh, I hope you find interesting. The, the phrases I have in parentheses put in what, what are the original words in Aramaic, which is the language of this part of, of the book of Daniel. The phrases have been used before in the book of Daniel. What is happening here in chapter 7 is that you pick up on some of the themes that have been mentioned earlier. First of all, this attempt by the little horn is an attack of God's authority as Lord and Creator. In the prayer by Daniel, the thanksgiving in chapter 2, one of the basic uh, truths that Daniel underlined is 
It is he, that is God, that changes epochs and times. And these are the two phrases you have also about the little horn. What does it mean that God is the one who changes times and seasons or epochs and times? It means that God is the one who is in charge of history. He has created the world. He is the Lord and Master. To make the attempt to change times and law is to try to take the position of God. Next, what the little horn attempts to do is to attack God's law of worship. Now all this has to do with worship. This is what the satraps and ministers said to the king. Issue the decree so that it in accordance with the law of the Medians and Persians cannot be altered or changed. Here you have mentioned a law that cannot be changed. This is exactly the same expression as you find in chapter 7. So when you read Daniel as a continued flow, you will realize that in chapter 7, there are references back, and by that you may come to realize what this attack is all about. This is attack on a law established by God as creator for worship. Look at the law of God. Where in the law of God do you find a specific law that is an expression of God as a creator and has to do with worship? This is the Sabbath. Let's move on and try to, to, to summarize the, the similarities. We have kingdoms in conflict, we have continuous worship, we have unchangeable laws that are attacked, and then we end up with the judgment of the saints. And let's read from chapter 6 and compare with chapter 7. In chapter 6, as we have read it once, O king, live forever, is what Daniel replies to his cry. My God sent his angel and shut the mouth of the lions. They had not hurt me because I was found innocent in his eyes. And then I have quoted in this case directly from the New International Version, I think it is. It's not simply my translation. From chapter 7, verse 22. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. So, so you have a parallel once again. Let's, let's pause and stop with these texts from the book of Daniel and ask ourselves, what do we learn? We are Seventh-day Adventists. We want to worship in the end time. First of all, it is once again emphasized, and you will realize there is some repetition here. The basic foundation has been laid. Once again, it is emphasized that worship public worship even is based on the private personal relationship that you and I have with God Daniel is an example imagine it would be said about you and me you are God he is a her God that it would be so so linked together that people could hardly think about you without thinking about your God you serve because you even if nobody watches regularly have communion with him in the calm hours of prayer. Next, still there is a doctrinal content to that worship. The Sabbath is to be the symbol of our personal relationship with our Creator. The Sabbath is also what gives us part of a doctrinal content when we worship God, because it tells about the Creator. He's not just anyone. Next, when you pray, you are in good company. Even when you pray alone, there is a heavenly prayer meeting. Angels are praying with you, thousands upon thousands, myriads upon myriads. You are always for, in a prayer meeting. You have a, 
a heavenly prayer community, even when you are alone. And so, by uniting with that heavenly prayer community, you are preparing for worshipping in eternity. Now, in the book of Revelation, it is singing. You know, you, you have to learn to sing with the angels of heaven so that you can join the heavenly choir. In the book of Daniel, it's praying. Learn, learning to pray like Daniel so that you once in eternity will be able to go to prayer meetings with the heavenly beings. So, worship conquers death. Death matters less when we are in that heavenly communion. Finally, remember there is a difference. Daniel was found innocent in the eyes of God. Now, you and I are not innocent. I am not. I know if I ask you, if anyone would put up your hand, then I knew it wouldn't be true. Because we are humans. We are sinners. We are not able to stand on the day of judgment on our own. And it was never intended to. We stand there justified because we stand in the Son of Man as our representative. What matters is not what you have done, what you have been, what you are. What matters is whether you have a living, trusting relationship to God in Jesus Christ. Some would say, well, doesn't it matter what I am? Is this not an excuse for going on sinning? I'll tell you no. Because the moment Jesus takes over in your life, you will be changed. Not because you struggle to be changed, but because you cannot avoid it. Search Jesus. Seek God and his righteousness. The other thing will come in his time. Don't be unrealistic. That is not what I say either. By focusing on Christ and not yourself, I do not say that you should be unrealistic and, and imagine that you are on the right path if your life is completely messed up in egotism and sin. The Bible is, speaks too clearly about that. The law is still there. But standing in judgment means that nobody will ever be lost simply because he or she is a sinner. That is what the cross is all about. We have all been given a new chance. We are just on how do we relate to that offer in Jesus Christ. And the saints of the Most High, they belong to Jesus. They are his. And don't fear because you are a sinner, because you're committing wrong, Trust Jesus. And don't imagine then that this trust means nothing, that it won't change you. Well, it will. It already has. Worship in the end time. Our public worship should be an expression of our personal relationship with God. We should remember the doctrinal content, because if not, it could be any God. We should be comforted by the thought that when we pray, we are in company with heavenly angels, preparing for eternity. And even if you are completely alone, remember, they are praying too. They are also praying for you. And if you are scared when looking at your own life because you feel like a sinner, then you are a sinner. But at the judgment day, you are standing in your representative the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, and he is all you need. Let us pray. Father in heaven, help us to grow in our understanding of what you want in our lives. Help us to grow in our study of the Bible. It is so rich, there's always more. 
there's always more. Bless us in that growth and help us to realize the fundamentals that we stand justified in Jesus Christ as long as we maintain that relationship with him. Let it not be an excuse for deliberate rebellion or sinning, but let it be the source of joy, of assurance, of power in our lives, and help us in times of need to remember that we have a prayer community in heaven. We may not see them now, but by praying to you we prepare for the day where we will join the angels in everlasting worship of the Son of Man. Thank you for your love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow is my final hour here on this topic and I will look at the more traditional Adventist text from a somewhat other perspective, put it into the context of worship. Thank you.